Welcome back, everybody. It is really cold in here, so I'm going to keep my coat on for this stream. Um, hope you had a good break. Uh, it's been about a week now, so we're, we should be finishing up um, homework four. We need the one more thing that we're going to do in the first 20 minutes of today's lecture in order to complete problem three, um, but otherwise you've got everything you need for um, homework four. And then after we introduce that, uh, we'll move on to solving systems of equations with f -solve. Um, and the syntax there, we'll sort of spread it out first to see where all the parts are, um, but then recompress it all over again to make it look more or less like the syntax uh, for F0. So the, the syntax will be the, pretty much the same, um, at least in the call to, to f -sol. We'll We'll see that the parts that are going to it are a little bit different if you open them up, but otherwise they're, they're quite similar. Um, before we get to the last part of F0, um, to, I guess one quick announcement, one would concern your, you and the other one wouldn't. On Friday's class, this particular lecture period won't uh, have a lecture. So the only lecture that I'm going to do on Friday is on the 12 to 1 period, um, and that's going to be fully remote. So nothing will be um, in person on Friday, and this particular lecture period won't happen at all. So I'll post the video from the morning one. It'll go up almost immediately on Twitch, and then you'll be able to watch it on YouTube within a couple of hours. Uh, but it'll be you know, very close to immediate on, on Twitch. Thursday, nothing changed. I'll still be here during normal lab hours Thursday. Um, so it's just the Friday that's getting mixed up a little bit. Um, okay, let's look at our examples from uh, Wednesday, and we're just going to modify two of them um, in a slightly different way. So this is our usual uh, root finding algorithm. Um, we've followed this pretty much every time, and that's the general approach I'm asking you to follow on Senge four or yeah, Senge four on homework four, uh, even if you can copy paste it from other stuff because this particular pattern is so common and it uses so many common functions in MATLAB that I really want you to practice it if you can. Um, I know copy pasting is uh, faster in terms of writing the code, uh, but it tends to sort of gloss over a lot of stuff that, that you might not know about if you don't actually type it out a few times, um, like I asked you to on the homework. Um, what we're going to do now is look at uh, this function, the one that we've got down here, which is our uh, root finding function. Um, we're just going to look at what would happen if we wanted a parameter in there that was adjustable. Um, so we wanted to be able to essentially modify that equation on the fly, right? We don't want to have to rewrite that function every single time we want to plot it and that we want to find a root in that function. Um, the ability to do that is inside of MATLAB, we can pass an additional argument to um, the local function the same way we could any other function. And it doesn't really change too much about the root finding process. Um, so we're going to practice that twice. Um, so let's set up a new live script for this. We'll kind of start from scratch just to illustrate the process uh, one more time. Um, I need a live script, so this. And zoom in a little bit so that we can see it. And we'll put that down there. Um, so our example today uh, will be solve, uh, let's say that it's that same one, cosine, x is equal to cosine of x, but instead of just cosine of x, let's put an additional parameter in there called beta. So solve this uh, for x, uh, where beta is an adjustable parameter. And that'll be our our goal, so I'll save this as example one. The general approach doesn't look any different from the normal root finding um, approach. The only difference is when we go to create the local function and then use it somewhere else, that beta is going to be along for the ride. Um, it's just an extra parameter. Uh, so if we look at the usual approach we would have, we wrote the function. Okay, we've got that. Rearrange it to root finding form. We've kind of seen that before. We just push it all to one side. And then the plotting step requires us to write the root finding function as a local function. And that's typically where I start when I'm starting my code, um, is to put the local function in here. So it would be something like function is out, um, and we'll call it, I guess RFF is fine. Again, we'll change it in the next one. Uh, and now I want two parameters. There's still the old x, which is the same one because I'm going to solve for x. Uh, but I'm also going to include beta as an extra input argument. 
the order doesn't matter here. You can go beta and then x, or x and then beta. As long as you're consistent throughout, it doesn't matter which order um, it goes in. So the output here is the function in root finding form, so that'll be cosine of beta times x minus x. So this is always root finding form. And now we can go about our life more or less as we did before. So we still want to plot this function. Because beta is floating around and I want to make sure that the plot and the root finding function all use the same value of beta, it's helpful if you just define a single value of beta. So let's say it's, I don't know, 2. I like to put it somewhere up near the top of the script so it's easy for me to find, although you can define it anywhere you want as long as it's defined before you try to use it. Um, and now we can generate some uh, x values, so we'll stick with minus 2 to 2 because that's what we did in the last time, last uh, example that we had. The function itself, uh, we just kind of need a name for that because we're just plotting it here, but we're going to say RFF of x and beta. And then we'll plot um, x and f. And then we'll add all of those goodies. And this is where I say it, it's not that you can't copy paste all of this, but it's nice if you don't have to think too hard about where all of these are coming from, right? I can kind of talk, and I'm making some uh, typos along the way, but I can kind of talk and type at the same time because so much of this gets repeated over and over and over again. Um, but you don't really know what the pattern looks like until you've done it enough uh, that you can kind of talk your way through it on other topics while you're simultaneously typing. Yes, it does pretty much always look like that. Um, so, uh, Copy pasting doesn't initially seem like a bad idea um, until you know you want to do it sometime and you only know how to copy paste and you can't find the thing that you wanted to copy paste and then you have to relearn it all over again. Um, so it does help to um, write it out quite a few times. Uh, and for folks on Twitch, I am on Canvas chat, but I'm I've got a warning right now that I'm not connected. So if you recently sent me a message, you might want to send it again, but it looks like it's okay now. So hopefully Canvas chat is behaving correctly. And so one thing that we can do, remember there's all kinds of things, well, there's not all kinds of things. Whenever possible, you should try to check your work just to see if it's behaving the way that you think it's behaving. So at the very least, if I change beta, I would expect this thing to behave differently somehow. I don't really know how, but if I change that from two to one, I expect my plot to look different. And in fact, it does look different, and if I set it to one, it's the same as it was before. Um, so it's just a check that I have, in fact, used beta in a way that's being processed by the local function. Um, so it's just a nice check. If we set it up to three, we get kind of these nice curly things, or up to four, and we can actually see that there would be multiple roots um, at beta is equal to four. It, it, beta didn't really have any meaning here. We're just playing around with numbers. Uh, but we're confirming that, yes, we are changing beta and it's having an effect on the plot. Um, so that's, that's good, right? It's a way of checking that we have um, passed that value into the local function in a way that it's having an effect. So now we can set up root finding on this, um, and we have to pass that value of beta into F0, uh, which we can do with virtually no change to our syntax except saying comma beta. Um, so our solution, we'll call x sol, is f0, still at x. Um, at x, remember, is the first part of a function handle, and it says, MATLAB, I want you to solve for x. The, the variable you should be solving for here, MATLAB, is x. What function do I want MATLAB to solve? That's the rest of the function handle. Uh, so this is RFF of x comma beta. So it's just going to put that value of beta inside of there. And then we need to specify which root we want to find. Um, I, there's a root, it looks like somewhere between 0 and 1. There's a couple of different roots on there, but the only one that I think is easy to find is the one between 0 and 1. So let's say that as our um, root bracket. And then, of course, we'll add that uh, to our plot at 0 as, let's say, how about green? We haven't done green. We'll remove the hold off up here because we want this one to go in the same place. And this isn't a bad time either to use that sprintf function to remind yourself what's the value of beta that I'm solving. 
so you can throw that into your title with something like S printf is beta is something, um, whatever it happens to be. And if that works, we should get a green dot on the root, which is right about there, right where a green dot ought to be. So one thing to keep in mind here is it doesn't have to be beta, right? It doesn't literally have to be a uh, variable called beta. You could also go through here and say, well, maybe I just want it to be the number 3.5. That's fine as long as you put 3.5 in both of these. Right? It, it's not that it has to be the variable called beta just because that's the input value. Um, as long as you update all of these to be 3.5, um, it will solve all of them just fine, uh, as long as you have been consistent. But you can see I had to change three different entries there for beta, right? Because we had the title, we had the F0, and we had the plot. Um, so it's convenient to pick a value of beta and call it beta, and then just pass that somewhere else. Um, maybe to distinguish it from the beta that's a variable, you could call it my beta if you wanted to. Um, that would be fine too. Sometimes it gets confusing if you have beta, 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 beta written all over the place. Um, so you can also just call it my beta. And that would also work. So the, whatever, remember, whatever the name is of the input function down here, that variable only exists when it, within the function's workspace. When you're passing values back and forth to the function, they don't have to share the same name. Remember, you're just passing values. You're not actually passing variables back and forth um, between the two workspaces. It also doesn't matter how many more uh, parameters that you have here. If you wanted to say um, there was a beta and maybe an alpha and maybe a gamma, you could do that as well, right? As long as you then pass alpha and gamma to the function, um, you can have as many as you want. You can also mix up the order in any way that you want as long as you're consistent. So it's not that X has to be first. Um, X can be anywhere you want because when you call F0 here, you're saying, MATLAB, here's at X, and I'm telling you by specifying that, I want you to solve for X. The thing I want you to iterate on is X. Um, so you can mess around with the order in there and it'll still work okay as long as you're consistent with the order throughout. So I'll just uh, pause here for a moment to let anybody um, catch up with any coding that they've got. Let's take a couple of minutes and do another example that you can work on. Um, I'm going to draw this example from our fluid mechanics example last time, uh, which was this. We had an energy balance, and we were given a delta H, a KL, and an L. Uh, one way that, so the way that this equation is actually used in Senge 4 is you're measuring delta H. So we can think of delta H as sort of an adjustable parameter in the sense that I can mess with settings on my experimental apparatus, measure a new delta H and pass it to my root finding function and root finding function will just pop out a new value of Q. So what we're going to do is essentially copy this. Um, we'll start a brand new one. Uh, we'll move all of this over. And I'll keep it displayed here in case you're not um, typing all of this. The only difference is that now delta H um, we're going to let this be an adjustable parameter. As far as the function is concerned, it'll be an adjustable parameter. What that would mean in practice sort of depends on what you're using the equation for. Here, in practice, that would be I've measured a different value of delta H. It would be nice to be able to pass that to my root finding function without having to update it in five or six different places. Um, 
so it, it's a good candidate for an adjustable parameter. Uh, so let's take maybe, I don't know, eight to 10 minutes. Uh, we'll come back at around like 323 to 325 uh, to solve this. I'm not gonna show the solutions from last time specifically to encourage you to try to write it from scratch again, um, since it is such a, a useful um, syntax to learn. I, I'd like you to practice that as much as you can. So everything you need is on here. Um, take a few minutes, see if you can solve uh, equation three for Q, but this time using delta H as an adjustable parameter. Uh, I am over on Canvas chat, but I'm gonna shut up here on Twitch. Uh, if you have any questions, you can throw them in the Canvas chat.
All right. Uh, one thing I want to note uh, before I start solving this is uh, this sort of a structure is pretty common, and it's one that you're going to see in homework five, uh, where you're solving systems of equations. And that structure is there's one, or there will be multiple equations in, in homework five, equation that I want to solve. Here it's the energy balance. But there's also a couple more equations that I have to use in order to just calculate stuff that shows up in those equations. It might be tempting to think I have to solve both equation three and this unnumbered equation for f. Um, you do have to evaluate f, but f is just a function that's dependent on the guess. It's not actually the one that we're solving. It would be possible to flip these equations around with suitable jiggling about um, and solve either one of them because they do both have to be true. Um, but they're, they're, you, equations are usually set up in such a way that there's a pretty clear one that you're trying to solve, and then there's some sort of like ancillary or supporting equation that just gets stuffed inside of there. Um, so try not to get them confused, although it is often easy when you're just sort of hit with you know, 10 or 15 equations and you're not sure which one you have to solve. That was step one, right? Remember, step one is write the function for, uh, or write the function that you're trying to solve. It does help to identify it, uh, because there will often be a, a list of equations that you have to solve, um, and only some of them actually need to go into the root finding function itself. So most of this is set up in a similar way, so we will jump to the function, uh, and we'll say output is equal to, I'll call it my function this time, just so we don't get into the habit of calling it anything else. The variable I'm trying to solve for is q, uh, and the adjustable parameter that I'm trying to to pass to this function is delta h. Just to mix it up from last time to show that it's okay to do that, I'm gonna put delta h first and q second. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. So inside of the um, local functions workspace, I will have access to a delta h and a q. I know by the time I'm all done evaluating stuff inside of here, I need to be able to calculate output as equation three in root finding form. Um, and so sometimes on a longer problem like this, I like to start with sort of the end of my function and say, what do I have to calculate when I'm all done? Well, when I'm all done, it's four times Q squared times quantity eight divided by three times F times L plus, I'm just gonna call it KL rather than sum KL. And then multiply all of that by one e to the minus four and subtract off delta H. So I've sort of, I, I visualize it as a sandwich bun. I've got the top part, which is my um, function definition, right? It shows all of the inputs. When the function starts, the only values and the only variables it's gonna know are delta H and Q. And then the bottom bun of my function hamburger here is output. By the time I'm all done, I need to be able to calculate everything that is in that line. So if it didn't come in as an input, I need to either define it or calculate it um, within the function. So I'll have something like L is equal to 60, uh, KL will be 0 0.4, and I'll have to calculate that F according to the um, nasty looking equation up there, minus 1.8 times log 10 of 0 0.05 divided by Q, and then take that um, and raise it to the minus 2. So that's kind of a typical, I think of it as a sandwich, right? You do the function definition, that starts it, and then you write the root finding function down there at the end, and if it didn't come in as an input, but it's still somehow used in the root finding function, you've got to define it inside of the, the local function. It won't know that it exists. Now that we've got that, uh, we can follow an approach similar to what we had before. I'll define delta H, um, which last time it was 35. We can call it 40 for this one. And now my approach goes back to plot it, look for an initial guess, and then root find. Um, so I can code a little bit faster if I don't talk at the same time, but we'll try. Lin space, I think, was 0 to 200 was a good guess last time. And then our root finding function is something like my function um, evaluated at delta H, and then we pass in the Q. So I'm being careful here. Initially, I, you may have heard me pause. I wanted to write Q comma delta H because I typically write it that way but my function is expecting it to come in as delta H and then Q. So I took a moment to make sure those were coming in in the right way. We'll plot them. I do black all the time, let's do blue. I wanna get an initial guess. So I'll put, um, 
actually, here's another way, to, in case you ever wanted to do this another way. Uh, if you wanted to go 0 and 200 and 0 and 0, this is also a horizontal line. Just to illustrate a different way to do it. We're plotting uh, Q, and specifically we're plotting our root finding function as a function of Q. Um, I like a square axis and a grid and a box. And we'll throw a title on there, um, which is, I think we can get, if we say slash delta h, we should be able to see that. Um, and we'll do this as just one. This is probably enough. One digit of precision on there. Oops, I forgot my S print half. I think title can actually accept it that way, but I, I'm never sure. So I just put an S print half for that. All right, let's see what we get. Ah, no, it can't do it. Delta H. So here's our plot. Um, it's a pretty well-behaved function. So when we're, what I mean by well-behaved is it doesn't have a lot of like wiggles or oscillations or anything like that. Uh, so we can be pretty sloppy with our initial guess. We could either just guess it or we could bracket it. Um, I'm gonna go with bracketing here just because I don't think it's ever gonna be more than about 200. Uh, so our solution would be f0 at q this time, um, and our root finding function is my function, where we pass in delta h first and then q. And I think the root's going to be somewhere between 100 and 200. You could certainly use an initial guess here. If you set an initial guess of 100, it'd probably find it fine, um, or 1,000 or something like that. Uh, it's a nice smooth looking function, so it's not going to have too much trouble figuring that out. And then of course we want to visualize the solution to make sure that it is where it needs to be. Um, so we'll put QSol at zero and we'll make it, ooh, we haven't done white before, how about marker face color white? And then we'll put a hold off on there. And there we go. I, we got our marker roughly where we need it to be. Again, the reason we picked delta H, eh, kind of, we just needed an example to fiddle around with. But also, if you were actually using this equation in a lab somewhere, and you, let's say, messed with your pump a little bit in Zen 4, and then maybe you changed you know, something about your piping somewhere else, you could come in here, make the adjustments to your system, measure the new delta H, and let's say you know, the next one was 32.6, something like that. And now you can rerun your script and it will automatically update that um, expression without you having to go through and change the plot and make sure it's at 32.6 and the F0 is 32.6, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's nice here to be able to pass delta H as an additional parameter. Again, it's not limited either to just delta H. Maybe something that you're doing is adjusting the length in there. You could also pass L as an additional parameter. Maybe in one case it was 50. Um, and we can put that after the Q. So we can have L's. Uh, and then down here it could be L. And then in our function it could be L. Right, so if I want to put a, an additional parameter in there, I just have to make sure that I'm doing it consistently. And don't forget, if it used to be down here, don't let it stay there. Um, if it is staying here, you can actually see MATLAB's giving us a warning it's saying, um, you appear not to be using your input argument L, because it comes in as L and then immediately gets wiped as L is equal to 60. So if you add it, make sure that you're not defining it here, because otherwise there's no purpose to doing that. And the uh, handle that you need for the root finding function, all you have to do is add the L into the call. You don't have to change anything about the at, because the at says, go find Q, and make Q the thing that you're going to iterate on and solve for. Um, it doesn't matter where Q shows up over here, as long as it's a Q, um, it will be able to find it. So I could run that as, oops, not number five there. I could run that as well, um, and now I could change around L values, uh, and those would impact my um, root finding function in the same way that the delta H did, right? It's just another parameter that we can adjust. That's what you're gonna have to do on problem three in your homework. So what you'll do in problem three is you won't pass a number, you'll pass a string. 
and your string will be an identifier of what molecule you're trying to um, calculate a heat capacity for. That string will go through and then you'll use like a switch case to say, okay, if it was you know, hydrogen, do this. If it was, oh, what are the other ones? Oxygen, do something else. Um, so it doesn't have to be a number either. It, it's a function like any other. You can pass whatever you want to it. Um, numbers, strings, I mean, those are pretty much all we tend to pass, but you know, it could be either one. So I'll wait here for about maybe a minute, minute and a half, um, in case you're catching up with any of the typing. Um, and then we're going to switch over to Excel to introduce um, solving systems of equations with, with FSOL. So we're probably done in MATLAB for today. Um, we'll get into Excel here in a moment. Okay, let's switch on over to Excel. We'll take a couple of notes here to get used to the idea of solving systems of equations. So generally, the, the type of problem that we're trying to solve um, is to say something like, solve a system of n equations for n unknowns. That's sort of the Type, if you think back maybe about a week and a half now to when I had classified the different types of problems that we typically have to solve, F0 handles one equation for one unknown and does it really well. But it can't expand out to more than one equation and more than one unknown. In order to do that, we need F solve. Um, and so that's what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, why would you need to do something? Because you have to do this a lot in engineering. There's, there's lots of times that you have to solve more, solve more than one equation for more than one unknown at the same time. I swear I thought that was a crow or a bat or something that came in here. One of the little insulating tiles, one of these things, just fell off the wall back there and kind of like fluttered down onto the desk. Um, I thought it was an animal or something. That was in here. Um, part of the problem is figuring out where are these equations coming from. If it's a math context, I don't know, it's, it's some mathematician probably just made up some equations for you. Uh, in engineering, at least in uh, chemical engineering, I wouldn't even say chemical engineering. Most engineering, these equations come from uh, conservation equations. So most commonly, uh, we get these equations uh, from conservation laws. Conservation laws, if you haven't been introduced to them yet, they are like the, the jewel, the gem of the last 100 or 150 years of effort that we've made trying to understand the world. They are true pretty much all of the time. As far as we can tell, they're true all the time. You might have to add more uh, parameters to get a more accurate estimate, but conservation laws are the bread and butter of engineering. Um, so just as an example in chemical engineering, or SENGE courses, the types of conservation laws and therefore the sources of these systems of equations. If you're in SENG 100, that's uh, conservation of mass and conservation of energy. And then when you go to 102, it's mass, energy, and entropy. And then when you get to 113, we kind of regress a little bit and mostly just talk about mass and energy. Although entropy is in there too. Uh, we don't, it, it usually just gets folded into one of the other equations, so we don't do it explicitly. 101A, we keep the mass and the energy, but we introduce momentum. 
101B, basically the same thing as 101A, except we focus more on the energy than we do on the momentum. Um, and then in 101C, mostly just mass and momentum. So your entire junior and uh, sophomore year in chemical engineering, all of those classes start with conservation laws. And so those are ultimately where we get these systems of equations. We often need to solve multiple mass balances and an energy balance, or multiple mass balances and the momentum balance, or something like that. So that's where they're coming from. Um, again, that part is pretty much handled by other classes, um, but I thought it would be useful to remind you now, we don't just pull these numbers out of a hat somewhere, or these equations out of a hat. It took us a long time to figure out that we can do this kind of stuff, so it, it's kind of neat to take a moment and appreciate it. But let's say you've got the equation, right? Once you've got it, you can kind of take your engineering hat off. That's, I mean, they're both hard in a sense, but that's the purpose of the other class is to develop your engineering skills enough that you can identify which equations you have to solve. And then we typically, as engineers, rely on something like MATLAB to actually do the solution for us. We don't write our own solvers very often. Um, it, it just tends not to be necessary. So in order to do that, uh, let's look at an example um, of two equations and two unknowns. The two equations, we're going to do that annoying thing that mathematicians do and write them out very generally. Um, so we're going to say our first equation um, is f of x, y is equal to g of x, y. And our next one is, uh, I don't know, r of x, y uh, is going to be equal to s of x, y. So this is our equation one, and this is our equation two. So we've got two equations, and we've got two unknowns. The two unknowns that we have are um, x and y. The two equations are these two. There are some functions, the f, g, r, and s, but we don't really care what those are. We're just trying to write them in the most general way possible. Those are our two equations and our two unknowns. We still have to be able to rearrange to root finding form, which we can do separately for those two equations without too much effort. Rearrange to root finding form. That procedure looks the same as it did for a single equation. Just move everything to one side. Um, and so this will look like zero. I'm going to drop all those parentheses and just say zero is equal to g minus f and zero is equal to s minus r. They're still functions of those variables. But it's just, it's kind of annoying to handle them for a while. So what we do when we want to solve these in um, MATLAB is to think of these not as separate equations, uh, but as different elements inside of a column vector. So this is our column vector. And they're no longer really equal to zero. The idea is that these would be target values, right? Zero is a target value, like it was before. When we get this solution, this solution to a system of equations correct, we should get about zero for both of those values. If we evaluate g, f, s, and r, and then subtract g from f, or f from g, we should get about zero, um, or actually the other way around too. Uh, and when we subtract r from s, we should get about zero. So those are our, our target values. Um, and so we can think of that then uh, not unlike the way that we used to target for f0, but now as a target for f solved would look something like a column vector of g minus f and s minus r. Again, make sure it's a column vector. It does have to be, that's part of the syntax requirement for f solved, is to use column vectors. So we're going to have column vectors everywhere. By analogy, we're going to keep all the other stuff as column vectors, too. Um, so for really no reason other than it's one of those very unsatisfying reasons, it's the syntax, right? It's, that's what you have to use. We can imagine bundling the unknowns. So we can bundle x and y into a column vector. By uh, convention, this is usually denoted as uppercase y.
And similarly, our solution, whenever we end up finding it, we're gonna get some values of x, or a value of x that's a solution, and a value of y that's a solution. By convention, this is denoted as capital Y, but now subscript sol. And there's one more um, that we need. Remember, we don't just need the um, variables and their solutions, but we also have to have a guess. Uh, and so we often will write the guess as not x guess, y guess, but as y, or uh, yeah, I guess y guess, but uppercase y guess. So there's still x guess here and y guess here. These we would write as capital Y S. So with that syntax, we can write the, or I should say with that understanding, we can write the syntax for F solve um, and make it look pretty much like what it did for um, F zero. So this is the general syntax for F solve. And we're actually gonna write this exactly like this on every example we do. So it's useful to, to keep in mind. The output is gonna be Y sol in the same way that our uh, output from um, F zero was our solution. Now it's gonna be F solve. We still do a function handle, but now our function handle isn't to a single variable, it's to this variable that's a column vector of other variables, so at y. We'll still have a root finding function. That root finding function will take y as its input. If we want to pass um, additional parameters, we do that the same way we did with F0. So we could also write comma, alpha, beta, L, delta H, whatever. Um, works the same way. And then the other input to F solve is our y guess. Those are always going to be capitalized. And in fact, I'm pretty sure every time we do this, it's always gonna be Y's. So a line that looks almost exactly like that is gonna show up in every system of equations that we wanna solve. Um, and the only difference will be that we will bundle different variables. Instead of X and Y, maybe we bundle like Q and T or M and T or something like that. Um, it, it doesn't have to be X and Y. It can also be more than one, or sorry, more than two. If you have four, then you have four rows for each one of these, right? You'll have four unknowns and four um, equations. So everything will be four by one vectors instead of two by one vectors. There are two limitations um, to uh, F solve, which are sort of, you can think of them as trade-offs. On the one hand, F solve gives us a really great ability to solve more than one equation simultaneously. That's huge, right? F0 just can't do that. But it does come at um, a cost. So one of those costs is that you can't bracket the root. Which means that whenever you want to um, use the y guess here, y guess is always just going to be a single guess for each one of those parameters. You can't say, I know x is between here and here, and y is between here and here. All you can do is say, I think x is close to this value, and y is close to that value. It's not possible to bracket the roots like we did with F0. That can be really annoying, because the behavior of systems of equations can be a lot more difficult to sort of envision or, or manage um, than a single equation. The other downside to this um, is it's hard, if not impossible, to visualize. So to do something like plot is really hard to do. The reason we would want to plot it um, would be to get the initial guess. So that is going to actually end up slowing us down a lot. It's not going to slow us down in here too much because for the most part you'll know roughly where the initial guess needs to be. Uh, but there are plenty of times where it sort of becomes the most challenging part 
of your entire calculation is just finding that dang initial guess that gets the thing to solve um, if you don't have an idea of where that um, initial guess should be in the first place. That can be really hard to do, um, especially as the number of equations goes up. So in, for example, SENT 113, it's not uncommon to have a system of five equations and five unknowns. And you gotta figure out like what should all of these be? And you, there's, there's some ways we can get an idea, um, but it, it, there's no two ways about it. It can be hard to get those initial guesses. Um, it can require some iteration just on the guesses until you get it right. The reason we can't plot it is we, we only have three-dimensional plots, right? The most we could do would be plot one variable on one axis, one variable on another axis, and then plot the response as the third dimension. Once you go more than that, I mean, what do you, what do, you do, right? We don't have a four-dimensional plot or anything like that. Um, there are some like triangular plots where you can put three variables on there, but they're more effort than it's worth. Uh, so getting those initial guesses very often comes down to figuring out something about the problem that you're trying to solve, which is why when I started, I had brought up the idea of these equations often come from something we know something about. Um, so often, at least in Sense 15 and Nano 15, I'll have to give you an idea of where to start your guesses um, or imply it somehow in the problem and say like, T is, temper is absolute temperature, that way you know it can't be negative, so you pick something else. Um, but in the quote unquote real world when you need Y guess, it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, there's no magic bullet that will get Y guess for you uh, and it often becomes a, a very challenging element of solving these systems um, to get an appropriate Y guess. We're gonna go over on uh, Monday one way to do that. Um, if the problem is simple enough, doing it in Excel is not a bad place to start. Excel can do all of this for you um, and you can play around with the initial guess uh, starting from nothing and it's a little bit nicer um, in here than it is in MATLAB. But then we'll rapidly transition back to MATLAB on Monday um, to keep working on EPSOL. So I will wrap it up there. Um, do remember that uh, Thursday is normal. Uh, nothing's going on on Thursday. I'll be here as I normally am. Uh, but Friday's lecture at this time is canceled uh, and the 12 o'clock lecture will be fully remote. So I won't be physically present in the room. Uh, but that's just for Friday. Uh, everything after that will go back to normal. So I'll wrap it up here. I'll see you on either Thursday or Friday. Bye, Twitch.